liebe Beiratsmitglieder, liebe Fellows, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, ich freue mich, Sie zum heutigen Abend begrüßen zu dürfen. Der Beiratsvorabend ist immer unter den zahlreichen Abenden, die wir veranstalten, ein besonders wichtiger Abend für uns, ein besonders wichtiger Abend, weil ganz schlicht wir unsere Arbeit ohne den Beirat nicht leisten könnten. Der Beirat ist entscheidend für die Fellows, die eingeladen werden, ist aber genauso entscheidend für die Fellows, die abgelehnt werden. Und äh, der Beirat liefert uns ein unersetzliches Schutzschild äh, gegenüber den abgelehnten Kandidaten, weil wir ja immer sagen können, es tut uns herzlich leid, aber der Beirat, im Beirat gab es keinen entscheidenden Rückhalt für Ihr Projekt. Und damit sind wir salviert. Und ohne das würden wir von Mal zu Mal in eine unendliche Bredouille geraten, wie man an der Geschichte der Institutes for Advanced Studies sieht, die über keinen Beirat verfügen und die zum Beispiel durch abgelehnte Fellows in juristische Auseinandersetzung hinein geraten. Das kann uns nicht passieren, dank dem Beirat. Es ist aber insofern ein besonderer Abend, Uh, because Paul Schmidt-Hempel is going to give us a lecture. Um, Paul, and I introduce him in English because he always speaks English, even though in the Beirat normally we speak German, but Paul always speaks English, and so I thought <laughs> it would be a, a betrayal if I introduced him uh, in German or auf Schweizerdeutsch. Um, Paul was trained at the ETH in Zurich, was then a postdoc fellow in Oxford, then went to Basel where he was assistant of Steve Stearns and I wonder whether it was easy to be an assistant of Steve Stearns, but I never asked him and probably if I asked him he wouldn't tell me. He became a professor for experimental psychology at the ETH in 1991 and has remained there ever since. But he has also been teaching in Cambridge in Vancouver, in Melbourne, and in other places. He has been a fellow here at the Collegue in 2006-07 as a <coughs> convener of a focus group on evolutionary immunology. And he seems to have been a very strict convener with very clear ideas about what the discipline of the group should be. In any case, I was told that at the first meeting, he told the members of the focus group, we shall meet regularly for work and we shall discuss, but we shall never meet for lunch or for dinner. That is, we shall never sit at the same table at lunch and at dinner. And this seems the members complied. And uh, so uh, this is a very interesting way to approach uh, social relations in the colleague. After that, he became a permanent fellow in 2008. And this fall, Powell's permanent fellowship is coming to an end. He will, I hope, still come and visit us in the future, the more often the better, but not anymore as a permanent fellow. So this is a turning point. And we thought it would be good to celebrate it. One possibility would have been to invite somebody to speak in honor of Paul or about Paul, but this, we thought, would not have fitted his character. So we asked Paul himself to speak on his own behalf, and I'm very glad he accepted to do so. The Wissenschaftskolleg owes Paul a huge amount of gratitude. His activity for the institution has been, I think, invaluable. Over the years, he has been acting as an untiring ambassador all over the world, trying to identify promising colleagues and to persuade or to seduce them to submit an application or to propose a focus group. If you look around this year, you wouldn't think that the Wissenschaftskolleg ever had the problem of not attracting enough biologists. But exactly this has been the case. For a very long time, the Wissenschaftskolleg was considered to be a Institute for Advanced Study focused on the humanities and the social sciences, a place that scientists would not find terribly attractive. 
If this has changed, it is last but not least thanks to Powell's activities, and I am deeply grateful for this. Not only because I think that the Wissenschaftskolleg is a good place for scientists and for biologists, but, and perhaps even more so, because I am convinced that biologists are good for the Wissenschaftskolleg. Without them, this place would be intellectually less varied and much less attractive. I shall not try to introduce Paul as a scientist, for I have no competence to do so. What I can attest, nevertheless, is his talent to make himself perfectly comprehensible also to people outside his field. I will never forget how, at one dinner conversation, he introduced me to certain paradoxes of sexual reproduction. His basic, basic point was quite simple and unforgettable, so as you will check in a moment. Uh, the result of natural selection, as he told me, is to increase the fitness of organisms. Once this result has been achieved, the most economic solution would be to transmit all the parents' genes to the offspring. And this is what happens in asexual reproduction. In sexual reproduction, only 50% of the genes are passed over to the offspring. Why, then, is sexual reproduction so widespread? A plausible answer, according to Paul, is provided by the fact that most organisms evolve competing with parasites. They build up defenses which the parasites try to overcome. So it's a race competition. It's an armament competition. Now, parasites in this competition have a huge advantage over their host because their lifespan is, of course, usually much shorter. Within one generation of the hosting organism, you have hundreds or thousands of generations of the parasite. Parasites, therefore, evolve much, much faster. In, in this coevolution, the hosting organism would have no chance of defending itself if it did not constantly change from one generation to the next. And it is exactly this constant change that is achieved by sexual reproduction. So this has basically changed my worldview. Parasites, of course, are one of the favored topics of Powell research. And tonight, he's going to speak about how to be a parasite. But before I pass over the microphone, let me warn you. Paul actually knows a huge amount about parasites, but he has absolutely no idea how to be a parasite. <laughs> let me give you just one example. Just recently, and only by accident, I found out that over the years, whenever Paul was flying from Zurich to Berlin, he was paying for the tickets himself and never asked the colleague to refund his expenses. Is this how to be a parasite? <laughs> of course not. It's the Wissenschaftskolleg who has been parasitizing Paul, and he has been the most gracious of all hosts. For all this, thank you very much. And now the floor is yours. Ja, herzlichen Dank. Also ich spreche auf Deutsch. Man muss sogar Zürichdeutsch für die Wand. Aber die Sprache der Naturwissenschaften ist natürlich Englisch. Deshalb ist es in Englisch heute Abend. How to be a parasite? So after your very kind introduction, Luca, I wonder whether you think how to be stupid or something like that. How to refund? Get a refund. Anyway. Uh, in the pre-chats uh, here uh, this evening, I had the impression everybody wanted to do parasites and was very keen to, to learn from me how to be a parasite and various things. No, this is not about sociology. This is about biology, sometimes hardcore biology. What I like to do is to give you a flavor of parasitism by first looking from the host side and then very soon switching to the parasite side and trying to lead you through a number of problems that parasites have to solve and how current biology thinks about these issues. Uh, this is not about molecules. They may be mentioned here and there. This is about things like evolution, natural selection, ecology, strategies, and so on. But best see for yourself, because our story starts now at a very unlikely place. Far from here, this is the country of Panama. 
one of the most interesting places on this planet, also biologically. And it's a story, some of you may have heard parts of it, which starts with the man that is here on this stamp, uh, which is Ferdinand de Lesseps. He is rightly known as the father of the Suez Canal that he built in the 1860s, and he was successful in doing so. So it was natural to think that for the big project of the Panama Canal, it would be good to have an experienced, he was not an engineer, he was an entrepreneur and a diplomat, somebody with a good organizing talent to make this thing work. Now, <clears throat> there was a lot of hope, of course, that these things would start, and this society was founded, the uh, Compagnie Universelle Canal Interoceanique de Panama. Of course, there was a lot of discussion where the canal should be, by the way. Nicaragua was already mentioned at the time. And finally, the society was put in place. It was funded. It was not all that easy, but the money was there. And the work was started. Actually, it was started on 1st of January, 1880, officially, where a party of guests was uh, taking the boat here on the Pacific side. So this is basically the Caribbean Atlantic side. This is the Pacific side. This is where the canal is these days. So they wanted to have the first stroke with a shovel on the Pacific side. And since a few guests came very late, which I'm grateful it ha didn't happen today, the tide at the time had run out and the steamer couldn't really reach the point where they wanted to celebrate this opening. So what they did is ultra French. They took an empty bottle of champagne, so they had emptied the champagne on the boat in the meantime, put a little bit of sand in it, and it was Lesseps' daughter that made the first stroke on this boat to symbolize basically the beginning of the Panama Canal. So all good, all well. Nine years later, 15 May of 1889, this society was dissolved. The canal was not even near the completion. In fact, it was just barely begun. So what happened? <coughs> this is what we have to imagine. First of all, there were some in engineering problems, obviously. I mean, uh, let's have thought they should make a level canal, like the Suez Canal, without any locks. It turned out to be very difficult, more difficult today there are actually locks, and uh, it's actually great that they have locks because it needs a lake and fresh water reservoir in the middle. Because every time you open the lock, of course, water flows down into the sea, so I have to uh, refresh that. And that's why so, so much rainforest is still around in Panama, by the way, because it keeps rain. It's actually a very good construction to preserve the rainforest. But it was at the time not usual to think much beyond any engineering problems. So they had all the kind of normal things. They put up uh, housings uh, for the workers, and you see here a picture how it must have looked like. These houses were not very luxur luxurious, but okay, but they were made of wood. Now we are here in the tropics. In the tropics, the organisms like this one, termites. They liked this wood quite a bit, right? So they had, first problem they encountered, is that the houses were eaten up by the termites. And you can see how this is done here in the tropics, quite usual, you put the house on stills. And to prevent the termites from coming up here, what they did is to put the stills into water tanks, so that they actually could, actually in tanks, so they could not really climb in. Now, Panama is not only a tropical country with termites, but it's also a tropical country with a lot of rain. And I can tell you, there is really a lot of rain in times. So these bins actually were not meant as water tanks, that they filled up with water. And now disaster, the real disaster came, which was this one. Suddenly it became a breeding ground for mosquitoes. And the mosquitoes themselves are nasty enough, but they were carriers. They were carriers of various diseases. Two were most prominent. One was malaria, and the other one is yellow fever. So what you see here is a micrograph of yellow fever virus. And the yellow fever, fever spread, and actually they lost thousands of people due to these infections, and the society at some point of the construction had to stop, not only because of engineering problems, but mostly because the labor force was dwindling because of parasites. Yellow fever is a disease, a virus that originates from Africa, West Africa to be precise here, yeah? And it presumably spread into the new world in the course of the slave trade of the 17th and 18th century, at least as what genetics uh, tells us in some of the major strains that are circulating in South America. And indeed, at the time, uh, yellow fever 
was one of the most dreaded diseases. It killed a lot of people. Not so much at the time in West Africa where people naturally developed immunity, acquired immunity sometimes <coughs> because they were ex exposed early on as, as children, for example. But for the white man, it's called the white man's grave, when they sent in people there, it was really a high chance that he wouldn't survive. As I said, the virus spread to the new world and the uh, actually caused a number that is are far from all of the major outbreaks that happened since then. And you see the first one that was recorded was 1647 in Barbados, the Yucatan Peninsula, Recife, and New York, despite the fact that New York is not a tropical city, obviously, but it was possible that the mosquitoes spread there and the disease spread there. Mississippi, Cuba, Philadelphia, Santa Domingo, New Orleans, New Orleans, 1905 was the last one that happened on the North American continent. And yep, I just looked it up in the WHO web pages. It's still going on, probably 20 to 30,000 people a year lose their lives because of yellow fever, almost all of them in Africa. And the latest reported out outbreak is April 2014 in the Congo. Fortunately, many people died. Santo Domingo with the Asterix is actually quite an interesting one because that's a time of the Napoleonic Wars and actually Napoleon decided to send an expedition corps to the Caribbean to actually get a foothold there and keep its uh, American possessions. It is reported that only about a third of the French soldiers survived the yellow fever epidemics at the time. They had to withdraw and 1804 uh, Haiti became an independent state, I think it was the second one of these states <coughs> in, in this hemisphere. So as you can see, disease had a lot, lot of impact, also some historical impact that is undeniable. When you talk about parasites, you also meet a lot of interesting people, by the way, not only parasites. One of these interesting people is Walter Reed. He was an army officer, and he was the one who eventually uh, had the lock or the key actually to unlock the problem of yellow fever to, buy, uh, to build the Panama Canal. He was American, and the interesting thing about him is, for example, he was stationed in what was then the Wild West for a while, so it was the time of Wyatt Earp and Billy the Kid, and he cared, among other things, for Apachans, uh, including actually the famous Geronimo, you know, the last uh, uh, chief that uh, surrendered to the U.S. Army. He had the good thing or the good thought that based on earlier work by Ronald Ross in India in particular, in actually also Bangalore, and uh, here is shown in uh, Calcutta actually, by the way, where he as the first man discovered that mosquitoes were a vector, as we call it in the biology, so a transport vehicle from one host to the next for malaria. And this idea actually uh, inspired uh, Walter uh, Reed to team up with Carlos Finlay, ex-Cuban uh, doctor, who had the same ideas, and they together actually pushed forward to see what the actual transmission pathways were of the disease, and finally came out with eradication programs, which you can see here, so spraying, for example, trying to get rid of the mosquitoes, which eventually, at the end of the day, led to the possibility that the Panama Canal was actually built by the Americans between 1904 and 1914. So it was opened in 1914, just at the beginning of the uh, First World War. It is just to finish the story, it was then Max Tyler, or of course with some Swiss origin, who was basically a South African uh, US uh, scientist who developed the first vaccine in 1937, if I remember correctly, got the Nobel Prize for that one, and in fact, it was also the first virus, if I'm rightly informed, that was ever isolated from a human, uh, human disease. So as you can see, it's a very interesting story that brings together historical effects, interesting personalities, and actually some deep scientific insight. To these days, if you go to countries like Panama, there's still an ongoing fight against yellow fever and its cousin, so to speak, which is dengue, which is a related virus that actually has similar problems these days in the third world that also is also spreading among people. So this is looking from the host side. And as you can see, there are things that we should be worrying about and there's a fight to understand how parasites work. We should not forget, parasites are also very, very common, not in humans, I think in the third world, but also in all other life in nature. And to illustrate that, I have this uh, image here of a perch, so it's a 
normal uh, Flussbarsch in, in German. It's a very good uh, fish to eat. And people have investigated how many parasites they find on this particular fish. So if I would make a quiz here, how many parasites would you find on such a fish? 350? 10,000? <laughs> um, I now should say this is not counting viruses or bacteria or anything like that. Just so the ones that we really can count individually. So we have a few figures. Uh, actually, the first of all, if you look where they are, that's where you find them. For example, here there are some flukes that live in the eyes. There are some trematodes, also cestodes that may attach here or go inside. And the figure is they find, actually, sorry, I should say this is where they belong to these various kind of taxa or groups. And you can see it's across the board from all possible biological taxa. You don't have to know them. Just see at the colors and see there's a, quite a range of different things that infect these poor fish. Actually, there are around eight different kinds of taxa, uh, parasite uh, species you like per individual fish, and roughly about 100 individual parasites that are on an average fish. This means in some, there may be 350. <laughs> In some, there may be only 10 or very few. So perhaps next time you order sushi, you think about this picture here. <laughs> <laughs> some of them have as a final host a vertebrate, a mammal like us. OK, they are very abundant. Very interestingly, they have also been around for a very long time. And I particularly like this story here. This is. Tyrannosaurus rex, I think everybody knows it. This is a famous uh, specimen called Zoo. And what, uh, Zoo. and what people actually have found in recent years is that in, if you inspect the bones very carefully, particularly in, in the, the jaw, uh, the lower jaws here, which is this part here, so you find lesions in the skull which are amazingly similar to lesions you find, for example, in birds. And they are caused by a very tiny creature called Trichomonas. This is this creature, it's five, 15 micrometers long, 15 millionths of a meter long. And they cause this infection which leads to lesions. And the consequence of that is that the jaw may break and the animal is unable to feed. So some of these giant tyrannosaurs probably did not die because an even bigger tyrannosaur came along, but because they were infected by very, very tiny creatures. And this is not the only proof that we have that diseases and parasites have been around for a very, very long time. This is 65 to 70 million years ago in the Jurassic. And as you can see, already there, they had to fight with it. So these are tiny creatures. And in fact, if you just briefly look back at the viruses I was mentioning, on the left-hand side, this is yellow PO virus. Here is one that you also know very well, and some of, it, uh, some of you may have had it. I had it this year for the first time for decades was very unpleasant. They're tiny, around 50 to 100 nanometers in diameter. What amazes me most is they have something like 12 or 14,000 letters that make up the genome, so bases, nucleotides, as you say. And they have only something like 10 or 11 genes. We have about probably 23,000, I think is probably the number. 10 or 11 genes, it's enough to make such trouble. Amazing. 10 genes against leseps. I think this is very respectful. We know all of them. We know the sequence. We know what they do. We know what they are responsible for, kind of proteins. And yet, we're not able actually to get rid of flu, for example, or of yellow fever, for that matter. So this means molecules are fine. That's probably no, not the only thing we should look at. So the question is really, maybe we ask, that we should ask is, how to be a parasite. If you were a parasite, and you would be an engineer that has to construct a parasite, a really good parasite, how would you do it? Of course, there are endless ways to do it. But a good way to actually think about the problem is to look at certain steps in the parasite's life cycle, certain problems that the parasite has to solve, and ask ourselves what is happening there. This is a very abstract host, maybe an individual or an individual host cell. This is the Julian, the parasite, <coughs> it has to come in. First of all, it has to find the parasite, uh, the host, sorry. Then it has to gain entry into the host to convince the host that it can come into the house, so to speak. 
Once it is inside, it has to replicate. At some stage, it has to build perhaps some transmission stages. Transmission means the transport or the way a parasite goes to the next host. And at that point here, number five, it has actually to leave the host and to find the next one, i.e. to become transmitted to a new host. That's what a parasite has to do. And if he's very successful to do it, it's a great parasite. So our chagrin. Now, as you immediately can see, that's not an easy job. And yet, millions and millions of species of parasites are there and make their excellent living. Let's first look at the entry step. Now, I here refer to some work that uh, we had done way back in this wonderful week here with Steve Frank, and it's a fruit of the collaboration at the time to sit here and think about it. And it starts here with our sort of puzzlement about a fact that is commonly observed, but it is still poorly explained. And this is that if you look at different kinds of parasites, pathogens, whatever, you find there's a striking difference in how many individual parasite cells you need to start an infection. This is table here, they're all uh, bacteria. Bacillus anthracis is the one that causes anthrax, uh, which is a very feared disease. You need about eight to tens of uh, five, so 80 to 100,000 cells to start an infection. If you go down the table, for example, here, uh, E. coli, e H. E. C., this particular type, you need only about 10 cells to start an infection. And very closely related one here, A. T. E. C., you need 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 10. Amazing, this difference. You know? There's millions times more cells to start an infection. Also, these bacteria are very, very similar in their lifestyle. In fact, part of that is explained by the way they infect, that they infect through orally, through the mouth, for example, or through the skin, and so on. But there remains still uh, a large part of this variation which puzzles us. Now, in the course of looking at this problem, we came across, for example, this one. This is Shigella, which is actually listed here as well, uh, here. It needs only a few cells to infect. Now, Shigella and some other bacteria have an ab absolutely amazing system to gain entry. And this is, this is the bacterium, Shigella. This is the host. So this is a host cell, for example, a cell in your gut. So you ingest this bacteria with some contaminated food. It gets in the gut, it gets close to the gut wall. And what it does then, it sends out some molecules. These are APAC, for example. Doesn't matter how they're called here. And what these molecules do with the number of intermediate steps is they convince the host cell to uh, change its surface shape. So what they start to do is to form some ripples. It's a bit exaggerated here, such that after a while, this bacteria is basically enveloped by the cell membrane and therefore internalized. So in other words, the bacteria convinces its host to act against the host's interest and to internalize this bacterium by changing its surface shape with some very, very specialized molecules. In this particular case, and that is known for many bacteria, they have evolved over the course of time different systems how to do it. One of the systems is the so-called type three system, where basically these bacteria form little needles. They're like syringes. This is shown here. So this is the bacterium here. This is the host. And the bacterium forms, this is a double cell wall here, uh, it doesn't matter for the details, but it forms a little tubule that actually is nothing else than a little syringe by which it injects its molecules into the host cell that then do the job and convince the cell to change form, to take the bacteria. So these are then the proteins that are sort of injected in this particular way. And you actually can see that in a micrograph Particularly the small, the short ones are the ones that are of interest here, the fimbria, that uh, partly correspond to this type three injector, so to speak, whereas these ones, the longer ones, may have other functions. But you can see this even, and they are very well known for the molecular detail how this is actually done. Interesting enough, there are different ways to do that. 
Forget about this one first and look at this one here. What I just described is this one. There's a pathogen, a bacterium, for example, that approaches a host cell. It forms these syringes. It punctures the membrane, so to speak, and it injects this molecule. That's what we call direct or local action. You know, these molecules are target with a target uh, approach injected into the host cell, and the host cell takes the bacteria in. There's another system where actually these molecules are not directly injected, but just sort of released into the environment, so basically by diffusion. Now, the discussion we had is maybe that's something, the different ways to convince the host cell that you should come in or you're allowed to come in that explains the difference in those. And you can easily imagine that if you have a syringe model, you need only a few molecules and a few cells to gain entry. Actually, everybody could do it on its own. It's like a guerrilla strategy. Whereas here, basically, you need an army. Right? You need many bacteria around that sort of diffuse these molecules, increase the concentration to a level that actually, by cooperative action, so to speak, there is enough there to gain entry. So in our first study at the time, we tried to compare this idea uh, whether or not this corresponds with the infective dose, which was our initial puzzle, sometimes very low, sometimes very high. And by and large, actually, it turned out to be correct, that those that actually are working individually needed very low doses, and those acting in cooperation needed higher doses. These are the different bacteria uh, that we had at our disposal, disposal at the time. And amazingly, the infective dose is not very well known for most of these pathogens, although it's a very, very important quantity. Now, in the meantime, just to reassure ourselves, a group in Oxford had redone this study recently and actually found exactly the same. So this is a study that covers now 43 human pathogens, including viruses, by the way. And what you can see here is the ones that act distantly, so they cooperate. They need a high dose, so this is the dose here. And those that act individually, locally, they need a low dose. Exactly what would follow from this simple idea that if there are different strategies to gain entrance, this would be shown in a macroscopic quantity like the infective dose. What they also found is that the lower the dose, the higher the case fatality rate. Case fatality rate is the chance to die from an infection once you're infected. And you can see that in some cases it goes up to 80%. Some are very benign here, a few percent. And this seems to correlate loosely here, at least with infective dose. We'll come back to this problem of case fatality rate a little bit later. Gain entrance means, apparently, to find your way by tricking your way into the cell. That's one way they do it. Now, the same problem actually should arise when you're inside the cell, when you persist, because no host is happy if you have an infection. So the first thing you want to do, basically, is either to clear the infection, remove everybody from the parasite, or to tolerate it to the extent that it doesn't do much damage. Let's look at the survival within the host. This is a very interesting parasite as well. Trypanosoma brucei, so that's of course the yellow one. These are red blood cells, human red blood cells. It's a trypanosome, a protozoan, so it consists of a single cell. And it is transmitted, similar to the uh, yellow fever uh, virus, by an insect vector. In this case, it's not a mosquito, it's a fly. It's the tsetse fly, the famous one. And everybody has ever had the privilege to be in the savannas of Africa in these areas knows how nasty they can see. So sometimes you walk out in these places because they really have gotten you despite the best of efforts. And if you're in an area where Trypanosoma brucei is endemic, so persists there for a long time, you have a risk to get sleeping sickness because Trypanosoma brucei is the agent that actually causes sleeping sickness. Now, Trypanosoma brucei infects long-lived vertebrates, humans. Uh, it can also infect, for example, things like cattle, where it causes uh, another disease called Madonna. How does it convince the host that it is not kicked out? Why can it persist for years and years and years? Oops, somebody mute. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
well, this is how it is done. It's not convincing the host, it's actually outsmarting the host. But African trypanosomes do, like Trypanosoma brucei, is they stay in there as an infection, and the host, so you, have only one possibility to see that, and this is to see the surface of the parasite, or the yellow surface. Once you see that, your immune system kicks in by the so-called adaptive response. If that persists for a while, you get rid of the parasite with some chance. However, the African trypanosomes are smarter because once this happens, they simply change the face. So they turn from yellow, let's say, to red and to green and to blue. In other words, they have a regular sequence here called variant A, variant B, variant C, variant D over time of the infection that raises in abundance, gets detected by the immune system, removed or actually attacked, and the same parasite changes its external coat. It is known that these parasites have a genetic archive. This particular case is about 1,600 variants, if I remember correctly, that they can regularly, in a regular schedule, sort of call from the archive, put it to the surface, and show it to the immune system. This is something that's also done by malaria, for example. So you have a number of parasites who are not tricking the host into manipulating something in that sense, but they simply evade the recognition by always changing its face. Very smart. Smart, smarter in a way than our immune system. So, Trypanosoma bruce has become a real problem, or is a real problem, and part of the success of the parasite, of how to be a successful parasite in this case, staying with the ho within the host, is to change identity. Interesting enough, we have in insects, so this is our system that we've worked with for quite a while, which is our common bumblebee here, Bombus thoracis, and this is Critidia bombi, a, our favorite parasite that infects these animals. <coughs> it's very common. As you can see, it belongs to the same group, to the trypanosomes. So it's a relative. This is the phylogenetic tree. These are our species, and it's a relative here of Trypanosoma brucei, which you just saw. So this is phylogenetic tree, meaning if the distance is large, they're not so closely related, so they're not very closely related to Trypanosoma brucei. They're very closely related to Leptomonas and Leishmania. And Leishmania, by the way, is also human pathogen. It causes, for example, Leishmaniosis. Also has a vector and so on. Our beast has no vector. It goes directly from host to host. It has some other very convenient properties which makes it very good to study. For us, this is, of course, a great system because we now can see how these things work. As I said, it's a very simple life cycle. The cells are ingested here by an animal, sometimes on flowers. So flowers are not only these wonderful, healthy things. They harbor disease that they can pick up. The infection develops in the gut, and some infective cells are shed out here after a few days even, and it can go on for the next one. So it's very prevalent, as I have been saying. It has no vector. It's directly transmitted. And the good thing is you can keep it in culture. You can take a single cell, put it in culture, cultivate it, and you get clones, i.e. genotypes of these parasites. What we noticed, and at first glance, this is quite independent from the African trypanosomes, but you will see it's actually very parallel, is that whenever you pick up an animal outside, a bee in the field or a queen in spring, and type its infections, meaning you determine its genotype, which determines a strain, <coughs> then you will see that each bee, so, so to speak, carries its personal infection because you never find the same strain again in the population, very, very rarely. This is shown here. So each uh, yellow uh, disc here is an individual host, uh, a bee or a queen in this particular case, and each cylinder here is a different genotype of the parasite. Actually, they have different colors and they have different numbers, even if you don't see it here. This means in this particular case, none of these uh, infections were found in more than one of these queens. Some have several ones of them, and some have only one. In fact, it's an enormous diversity, such that you almost never find the same genotype again. We were wondering, seeing it on uh, by regular, for example, whether this means that this parasite is clonal or sexual. We could mention briefly the problem of sex. Now this is from the other angle, so to speak. You can see here the cells that's dividing. <coughs> and of course, the experiment in principle is very simple. Technically, it's a little more complex than, than what's shown here. So in fact, an animal with two different genotypes, and you just see what comes out in, in the ship, in the feed. And you type it, 
and ask what happens with these infections. And the effect is shown here. We look at this graph here only. Uh, in this particular case, in 84% of the cases, those genotype strains that came out at the end of the animal, so after the infection has passed through, were still the same, where the parenteses were. Nothing has happened. But in this 17%, something else has happened. In 10%, for example, about half of these cases here, they were recombinant. For the biologist, really nice Mendelian recombinants, as we will make when we make our zygotes, the sperm and eggs, for offspring. Do exactly the same. In the other half of the cases, there are completely new variants coming out. We have a good idea why this is so. But the point here is that in 70% of the cases, this produces new things. So if these two genotype, two different strains of a parasite, find themselves together in the same host, they exchange genes. They have sex with each other. And they produce offspring, which differ, in this particular case, from their parent. Now, we are very close now. We're back again to the problem, what to do to be in a successful infection if the host homes in on you. The African trypanosomes, each individual changes external code. Here, they simply cross genes, exchange genes, and produce offspring that are different. This is exactly what we do as well in the theory or in the, the idea that Luca was mentioning. So we were looking at what's happening in such a, an average colony. This is a nice drawing of uh, uh, such a bumblebee colony uh, about its full uh, swing. It has probably about 60, 80, or 100 workers. And what you can see here is what's happening with such an infection. Here is a sort of a two-dimensional space here, uh, axis one and two. And here are two points. These are basically the position of these two genotypes in this space. So the farther apart these points are, the further different these are genotypically. So it's uh, basically a, a statistical trick to make visible how, diff how far apart these genotypes are in the infection. And this is the ones we have infected. And look what's happening after the infection has gone through the colony. That's all produced anew. In fact, out of five different types, we produce more than 400 new variants. So this is very amazing. This is a machine that actually generates diversity in very unprecedented ways. And it's very similar to what actually uh, the African trypanosomes do. Most of that is actually already ready in the queen that carries the first primary infection, by the way. So if you compare these two things, it is very striking that you have here a, a nice case of the same problem, this is to be a successful parasite. It's solved in a way in the same, same, uh, same kind, namely change the genotype or the express genotype in the case of the trypanosome. So they take genetic variants from their archive, express it in regular intervals. They here don't care about it. They actually just have sex and produce different offspring. And if you compare these things, this is human disease infection, very long lasting primary host, so the vertebrates are, are actually very uh, long-lived. This is a social insect disease. The individual stem cells are not very long-lived, maybe three weeks. Actually, they have long-lasting infections relative to the lifetime of the actual of the host. They solve it by antigenic variation, as it's called, this change of code. They uh, actually solve it by sexual variation. And in both cases, it prolongs the stay in the host. So in this case, we have just variability, change, or change your identity as the trick. Let me come to the last stage here in, in this cycle. This is the stage when the, when the parasite has to transmit to new hosts. And you probably recall this one. Now, this is the mosquito that transmits, for example, yellow fever or any other nasty disease like malaria to new hosts. If you were a parasite that is residing in this host here, so this animal or this human that is sick. What would you do to increase your chances to actually get to the mosquito into the next host? Any ideas if you were an engineer? It's a little bit of a quiz to keep you awake. <laughs> what would you do if you were an engineer and you had full power? Make the host attractive to the mosquito. Exactly. That's one way to go. So people have study, uh, thought about that and they've made experiments. I'll show you the experiment here. This is an experiment done in Tanzania with children, all under ethical standards, of course. 
in an area where malaria, this is about malaria, which is very prevalent. It's actually at the former Swiss Tropical Institute Research Station in, um, in Ifakara in Tanzania. <coughs> what you have in this arrangement is a cage full of hungry mosquitoes. Now, mosquito females, only females that are a problem in this case, because they need blood to develop the ovaries, so they have to suck blood. The males are harmless. They have been starved, these mosquitoes, and now hungry to get a blood meal. And what you offer to them actually is you have here an outlet and here an outlet. In fact, you have three outlets here. It doesn't matter at the moment here. So just look at these two. Now they can fly in and then choose whether they want to go left or right. Now here behind is, is, so, or is, a, is a target. I'll come to that in a second. And what these researchers could do is actually to count how many mosquitoes would want to go to the right and how many would want to go to the left. The full arrangement looks like that. So this is where the children slept in these little tents. Of course, they couldn't be infected because there was a net, so the mosquitoes couldn't go there. But they could count how many would actually go to the left or right. Now, as the uh, gentleman has just said here, uh, what you expect is that the mosquitoes would go there and be attracted to those humans that are ready, actually, to give them parasites. And amazing, exactly this is what's happening. You see this here. Look at the red bars, forget about that for a second. If you have children that are not infected versus children infected, there's a significant difference here in the num average number of mosquitoes that are attracted in the experiment to this compartment, not only the right, not always the right one, of course, the compartment that has a child that is infected. So the mosquitoes find it more attractive to go there where a child is actually infected. Now what these people have also done is they have treated all children with uh, a, a drug, Fancidar in this particular case, and cleared out the infection. Now you wonder what's happening afterwards. This is what's happening afterwards. Actually, once they were infe uh, not infected before and after, there was actually no difference statistically. But those that were infected were afterwards cleared of the infection were no longer attractive. So apparently mosquitoes sense where these parasites are. Even more amazingly, there's two, st <coughs> two stages in this life cycle to parasite malaria. One is the so-called asexual, and one are the so-called gametocytes. It's only the gametocytes that can be transmitted. Only those are infective for the mosquito and go further, but not asexual stages. So if you repeat the experiment for the asexual stages, what you get is this one. Not distinguishable, basically, from the controlled, non-infected situation. So what you have here is a fairly convincing experiment that shows that exactly what was proposed before is actually true. Somehow, people that are infected by malaria parasites that are ready to transmit gametocytes are more attractive for mosquitoes than others. Nobody knows how this is working. It must be, of course, by odor, because the only source of information here is the odor that came over. And so we smell differently to mosquito depending on whether or not we carry an infection that is ready to be transmitted. OK. Let me actually come to the last and uh, shorter part. You may ask yourselves now, all guy by uh, good and, and well, but why are parasites actually damaging the host at all? I mean, of course, that's how they define. But why the hell are they damaging? In fact, that's not a good question. The better question is, why are some parasites harmless and others are really highly dangerous? And we have many of these cases. This is a spectacular one. Two very close variants of variola virus. One is harmless. One is very deadly, the smallpox pocket. Actually, it's now declared eradicated, and it actually is eradicated. And it has been reported in history, like, for example, the Central American reports, where people were also struck by the smallpox brought in by the European uh, conquistadores at the time. Yeah. Well, the usual answer you get is, yeah, of course, that's, that's very clear, because only well-adapted parasites are nice to the host, because if they kill the host, they will also remove their resource, right? So we, that's what we have to expect. Uh, a very, very simple calculation shows this is actually not true. This is called classical wisdom. <laughs> what a parasite has to do is actually to get transmitted to a new host. So a few cells should get to the new host and get infected. What's happening here is not the prime interest of the parasite. It's not that they want to kill you. But what is it then? Well, you see, you can actually do a very uh, simple calculation. For example, if you compare a virulent parasite 
that's infecting here a person. At some stage, a person is killed by the parasite. And in the meantime, it has the opportunity to transmit, for example, a virus to a new host, the red one. A harmless one would be much less virulent in the sense that the host lives longer, and it will also transmit the new host. All you have to do at the moment is to take a toll. I mean, to calculate how many new hosts have been infected, and you would immediately see that, yes, harmless is nice. But if this one, who is more virulent, manages to infect more in this short period, it's going to win because it has more new infected hosts. And for the same reason, of course, it can make the opposite and say, well, actually, it doesn't even count the secondary infections go further here. You can say that if you are too virulent, it's not a very good idea either. If you're actually killing the host too early, you end up with fewer than if you were harmless. And immediately you see without any math that actually the truth must be somewhere in between if you do the right calculations, if you think at the right problem. So success, again, as in other organisms, is replication, survival within the host. We see many tricks how actually hosts do that. It's transmission. We see some tricks how actually transmission is increased. And together, this is the fitness of the parasite. So I must say, it's a bit more complicated <laughs> because we have actually epidemics going through and the secondary uh, effects. So you come up with some models, basically with some compartments here, non infectors can uh, turn into infectors to get immunized, lose immunity, and so on. This is known as the standard uh, epidemiological model and actually needs some maths to come to the conclusion. But the point is exactly what I have been saying before. There is a logic behind it that some parasites, depending on what they do, are not very harmful and others are. So perhaps some of that explains this difference. If you're still awake, follow me to the last round. And this is actually bringing things back to what I said before. Parasites have been, all parasites do it in incredible ways, manipulate the host for their own benefits and actually fiddle around in incredible ways at different stages of the life cycle. If now you look at it, and that's probably the hardest piece here tonight, <laughs> from the age of infection. This is when the host is infected, time goes along, and as time goes along, the parasite density increases, so it replicates within the host and replicates and gets more and more, okay? The same would be here, same situation. Now let's imagine that we decide that the parasite is able to do something about its environment to prolong the duration of infection. So it starts to fiddle around, for example, with the immune system of the host or evade it by changing identity and so on, which we call here an evasion, for example. As a consequence of that, it gains an additional time to survive. So you said, it doesn't matter so much the symbols here, but it gains the blue area. So this is very profitable for any parasite. If you extend it, wonderful, because you not only gain a chance to stay alive here, you have a certain chance to stay alive here. It can also do something by increasing its transmission success, for example, the same point, but instead of doing something that prolongs its survival, it does something that increases its transmission. And we have seen su such, a, such a, an element by this mosquito experiment, so you smell better for the mosquito. Here, for example, changing coats. That would be an example for that. In both cases, it's very likely that you do something which is not very healthy for the host. So you fiddle around with, for example, a cytokine, a molecule that is necessary to coordinate the answer. And as a consequence, at some other later point, actually, you get an effect which we then call virulence, so a damage to the host that is visible. And now, again, it needs not a lot of mass, but just a little bit of logical thinking to see, first of all, that if you're a parasite, this is always better than this one, matched for the same consequence later. So if you do the same damage for the host at the same time, say a little bit later, it's always better to prolong your survival within the host because not only can transmit now, you can transmit in future elements as well, than it is to increase your success momentarily because you don't capitalize in the future anymore. So this is a very logical consequence of the flow of time essentially, if you're philosophical about it, which means that most phenomenon that we see that produce virulence must be of that type. Has some, have something to do with the ability to prolong the survival in the host, and less so here. On the other hand, it may happen that if the distance <laughs> between what you do now and the fatal consequence of the host, if this distance actually gets shorter and shorter, 
you can afford to produce more virulence, so to speak. Let's say inev inevitably, if you produce something here, actually this interval can get short, and at the end of the story, so to speak, you end up with something that does a huge effect, kills the host almost immediately, and gains transmission. This is what actually you find in nature. There are many parasites that kill the host in order to get transmission. Final stage transmission, so to speak. So this simple uh, sort of consideration show you that actually the way these parasites manipulate their hosts are very important to understand the problem of virulence in the first place. And just to give you a brief idea, again, you shouldn't read all that, but to give you a table here, these are the uh, six uh, top candidates for bioweapons. Sorry about that, but these are the, the most convenient uh, biological agents uh, for actually a bioweapon. This is anthrax, botulism, Q fever, tularemia, plague, and smallpox. This one is eradicated, but there are labs, as we know, that still have stocks of that one. In each case, again, this is how actually the, uh, the virulent effect is generated, but in each case, now you could, for example, read here, but it sees for, uh, you can see, for example, that uh, some of these uh, molecules that these uh, uh, bacteria produce, these are interesting, all bacteria except of this one, uh, produce something that actually suppresses, for example, a particular response of the host, for example, inflammation. That's what you see in sort of red swelling. And the inflammation is not very good for a parasite because it's defensive reaction. It's not very good for a parasite. So the first thing it has to do is to reduce this, this kind of uh, uh, inflammation process. That's what they do. This is no proof that the diagram I was just showing you is actually true. But it shows that almost every dangerous parasite you have has also a large repertoire of mechanisms to actually evade the immunity. How do you see two things belong together is still out there. Okay, two slides ago, three slides ago, then we're there. But I couldn't resist to mention the final point here. Amazingly, particularly for gut parasites, they're not alone. This is also true for our animals. This is a PhD work that's done a long time ago. And what Hauke Koch discovered is that each animal carried its internal flora of bacteria. They're very different. Actually, this one is different from this one, different from the honeybee and so on. Again, the details do not matter. But what he found as well is that if you have the infections of a pet parasite, the outcome <coughs> depends on having your bacteria with you. If you clear the bacteria out with antibiotics, you get a high infection load, so there's a number of cells in infection. Also, if you keep them sterile, they don't have any uh, uh, microbiota, as it's called, this bacteria. Also, if you give them some unrelated bacteria, only if they get the full complement from their sisters, they can defend themselves against the bacteria. So the story gets even more complicated. And as you can easily imagine, the simple processes that I was describing, in fact, are very, very uh, complex. We have it too. Just wanted to mention that. Right? So vertebrates like us have it too. This is the number. For example, here in the mouse, we have 800 bacterial species. In the anterior nares here, we have 900. Uh, we have here 1,300. The highest load we have in the feces, so in the gut, 4,000 different species of bacteria that live within us. And the uh, bluish numbers are the number of genes to represent, different genes to represent. And if you do the calculations, almost close to a million foreign genes that we carry with us against 25,000, 23,000 that we have as humans. So vastly outnumbered by these bacteria. They help us. Let me conclude, then you're released. <laughs> Majority of uh, organisms are parasites. He didn't mention that. The estimate is 60, 70 percent of all organisms are parasites, and the others are hosts. It can have serious in impacts. I think the very interesting story of Panama shows it has even impact on human history and human endeavors. To actually get to grips with them, we need to understand not only the molecules, it's also interesting, but we need to understand the question how to be a parasite. What is the strategy? What makes a successful parasite? I've been talking about those virulence to gain entrance, you manipulate it. If you talk about the effect, you have to look at the goals of the parasite, what is its fitness, and only then you understand what is going on. I've been talking about variability, which is a very important element, in this particular case, outpacing the host by changing either individually or producing offspring. And there is a third party involved. I mentioned these three things because there are three uh, remarks here. 
which I found really interesting. I have no answer to them, but it's food for thought, maybe for the uh, drinks after it. Are we manipulated by parasites? We know from the Human Genome Project a lot of retroviruses in our genome, and uh, I think nobody knows what all of them are doing, really. So are we manipulated? There are studies, by the way, that show if you're infected by Toxoplasmosa gondii, <laughs> which you get from your cats, for example, you're more likely to fall victim to a car accident. Uh, wonderful. <laughs> Variability is an important element here. Is this an original major driver for our individuality? And I mentioned that because individuality is a high good for us humans. And finally, if you have one million genes against your 23,000, who are we? I mean, is it the one million genes of the bacteria or is it the 23,000 that we think are ours? So with that, I'll leave you for food of thought. Thank you. <laughs>